Thank you very much, Francis. It's always wonderful to listen to you because you do put things in, in, the, in the context, but you make it very difficult also. And I would like to thank both Azar and Mahnaz for the introductions and for putting us in the um, correct mood, so to speak. I have all kinds of notes which I'm not going to use, except for one section, uh, because uh, I think this, the, the introductions have guided us in a certain direction. Uh, but just to say to Mahnaz, um, uh, I'm very honored to be part of your team. As all of you know, I'm retiring in December, and I'm a Muslim with a choice, and I'm going back to the lion's den. I'm going back to Saudi Arabia. And so uh, it is a choice I have made, and I'll be between Jeddah and Cairo, uh, basically, because that's where I feel I belong. So in that sense, uh, I am a Muslim with some choice uh, to, to think about it. Um, but as you have talked, I remember uh, the first time I came, uh, I met Mahnaz was on a, in a seminar in 2002 on violence against women. Uh, and I presented a paper looking at domestic violence as a reflection of the political violence in the society, and that they are parallel, um, and also the violence that is in the corporate world against women. So we had three pillars, the corporate world, the political world, and the family world, and they're all related to one another. Regretfully, with 35 years in the UN, that still remains true. Uh, there has been changes, voices have come up, it's true, but uh, the, the issues uh, are, are still there. Um, and I believe that women's issues are the litmus test for whether a society is healthy or not. If women are not healthy, the society is not healthy as a whole. And so it is a litmus test for that. And when we talk, and, and Azar mentioned, and, and uh, Mahnaz also mentioned that issues of women do transcend uh, I think Mahnaz were the one religion, race, borders, etc. We even see it in, in our work in the humanitarian, humanitarian world, where women are willing to even cross warring factions in order to survive and bring survival to their families and communities. So they even go beyond you know, the, the, the physical and, and the beliefs, but also to the dangerous world of working with the enemy for the survival of, of the family. Um, and I, but here is the challenge. As we say that the issues of women transcend, and I'm going to add to, what, uh, to the complexity that Francis said, yet the challenge is in the specificity of each culture and each context. So even though we say that women's issues are across ethnicity, borders, etc., the daily challenges are what we face every day in the interpretations of what culture is, what religion is, and what do they see. And therefore, the work we need to work, we need to work at many different levels, the global movement of women, but also not only the national movement of women, but we have learned that without the community basis, something that you, the uh, Women Learning Partnership does quite well, how do we get communities themselves to feel that they own this agenda? And I think this whole discussion about culture and religion, the bottom line is about ownership. Is it an agenda imposed from outside? Or is it something that people feel they want to change, and they are willing to change, and they move to change? And this is what we at the UN, and I have to use my UN experience, just you know, tr struggle with. Yesterday, we had the opening of the summit on the Millennium Development Goals. And you know, this, the, issue has the social issues have, become, have risen up to the level of heads of states and heads of governments. So it has become a political decision. There was a, a panel, big panel, on um, maternal um, education and health. And of course, maternal health, Millennium Development Goal number five, we keep on repeating it's the one that hasn't moved at all or very little. There is some movement, but not enough. And when you hear the heads of states and governments, ministers of planning and so on speak, they're all committed. So the question becomes, if you're doing all of that, then what's the problem? There is a problem some, somewhere that hasn't come. And I can see it, and this will impact how we deal with the ownership, the culture, and religion perception. The first one is that the, we see the issues of women as being a sectoral issue. If we're talking about women's health, then it's the Ministry of Health. And it's, it's imprisoned into the budget of the Ministry of Health, into the thinking of the Ministry of Health. While it is really, and we keep on saying, the health of women is more than health. And if we look across sectors, 
in the Africa Union, there was a panel again on maternal health. And my question, the presidents keep on saying that, you know, we have competing demands. We have um, issues of uh, electricity, roads, etc. And then you come and tell us you also want issues of women. What do we do? And so basically my response was yes, if you have women's rights and women's well-being as a priority, then when you decide on a road, whether the road goes to a farm of a rich man or it goes to a clinic that serves multiple, then that's the kind of decision. So you, you have leveraged more resources from electricity and roads in order for women's health to be. But the bottom value I told them was the fact that what is the value of women for you? Do women have a value or not? And I think this is where the culture and religion hit us most. Uh, and here where we should be talking whether we should infiltrate or we should uh, confront. And I believe both strategics, the strategic the strategies are important uh, because you can infiltrate to a certain extent and mainstream these issues, but also sometimes you need the struggling voice to bring about uh, the change that we're talking about. Um, I think the issue also um, of stereotyping, and we feel it, we live it every day, um, and I'll tell you just to ease the pressure a little bit, I was meeting a few years ago with the president of the European Union, and he kept, in the middle of our discussion, he would stop and tell me, are you really a Saudi? And I keep on saying, I swear I'm a Saudi. Are you really a And he, we go discussion and discussion, money, and, the, and then he stops and he says, you're really a Saudi? <laughs> so there is a stereotype about me, yes. who I am, yes. uh, wherever you go. And that's part also, I'm not only a Saudi, I'm a Saudi, I'm a Muslim. And I'm a practicing Muslim who's promoting, promoting cultural, the positive cultural values. So it becomes a package that has to be entangled or, uh, you know, put apart in order to understand it. Having said all of this, I will come just quickly to uh, the, the issue of culture and religion. And here I believe that whether, where the origin, even the value of peace that you've talked about, war is waged in the name of peace. So we say peace is positive, but we also go to war for peace. So how does this come? My professor here will explain the, oh the, 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 real, uh, the real issues there. But I want to also mention that we are confused societies, communities, mixed culture and religion. I remember in Bangladesh, I was visiting a hospital for fistula, but also they took me to a ward where women had acid on their faces. And so I was talking to them and I was telling them why, what happened to you? And all of them, there were about six who talked about that happened to them because the husband threw acid on them because their parents, their father, couldn't pay the dowry. So I said, but look, you are a Muslim society. In, in, a, in, a, in Islam, the man pays the women, not the women pay the men. They said, oh yes, the, women do pay, the men do pay a small amount, but they expect the women to pay the, other, the, the larger amount. So here you have a mix between Hindu practices and religious and put together. So I think also how do we define and, and uh, you know, between culture and religion that get mixed up, social practices and so on, needs also a definition. But finally, I want to tell you in your NFPA, from the time I came in, the agenda of Cairo, and has been mentioned by Azar, I think, reproductive health until now is still a controversial issue. It's still a fight, and Francis has been living this fight with all of us. Um, Yakin, in her uh, position as rapporteur, uh, has also faced that. The issue, in the General Assembly, they're talking about maternal mortality only. Women don't need to die because they're giving birth. But universal access to reproductive health is still a question. And so that debate is going on. So when I came in, my, my, my contribution was that this is a wonderful organization, that Dr. Nafis Sadiq has taken the ICPD agenda as far as it can go. My role is to, one, improve uh, performance, but also to look at the implications of reproductive health. And here we introduce a program that's called Gender, Culture, and Human Rights. And the whole idea is that human rights and culture collide around issues of gender, the roles of men and women. And in our work, we, we looked at case studies, we looked at our field, we looked everywhere to understand it. And we came out with eight principles. I'll mention them very quickly because they link with the discussion. The first one is that cultures are realities in which everybody functions. 
So you can't ignore it. We have to look at it. We have to analyze it. And we have to understand it. And that people will not come to us, feminist women or women leaders, when they are seeking advice. They go to their community leaders, who are often men, and they can be religious leaders. So there is a reference point for the communities that we are not. And we have to recognize that we are not the reference points. Principle two is that people are products of their cultures, but they also create these cultures. So they can change them. It, it cultures are neither static nor monolithic, and that every culture is, is, has a certain characteristic. It's diverse. It should be contested and can be contested. And this is coming to that. And that um, in the private and the public space, we can mediate, negotiate the different interpretations. So it's a very dynamic factor of our life. And if we have the right information and leadership, communities can then contest these practices and can uh, find different interpretations. Principle four is that cultures have a strong impact on the social sector and on social relationship, but certainly on power, gender power relations. Principle five is that through change from within, societies and communities can then uh, find different expressions. So change has to come from, it, from within. It can never be coming from outside. And one worry I have right now is that we hear many of the donor countries, especially the Nordics, uh, European donors, are changing their bilateral aid mm -hmm. from education, health, etc., to focusing their aid on democratization. Mm -hmm. Now, what is democratization? What it is that's going to happen if you still have people dying, uh, illiterate, etc., etc. So that is also a new thing. The idea that we can bring change. We waged war in, 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 in Iraq to bring change for women. They have done worse. I've lived in Iraq for eight years and worked. Their, their situation is far worse than when, when, the, when the invasion took place. In 1990, when, when, uh, when uh, just before uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, we were working with the Iraqi Federation for Women, and we had produced together the best family laws that uh, could have come. They came from all the different sects and to, to promote them. And there were the best labor laws. I remember there were two documents that were printed in thousands so women can have copies of the new family laws and so on. What happened is that once the invasion took place, the new government took place, they went to the family laws of 1958. So all of that was erased, and women went back to a worse situation. So change cannot be imposed from outside. It has to be a process that is inside to take place. Uh, uh, number six, principle six, is that cultural independence and cultural diversity uh, can be mediated in terms of human rights. And principle seven is that cultures and genders share common, uh, uh, and religions share common denominators with universal standards. There are basic standards that are found in religions and cultures, such as the principle of human equality, compassion, and tolerance, if they are interpreted the right way, of course. And principle eight is that human rights, and the question that uh, Francis asked, where did human rights come from? The Declaration of Human Rights was basically formed, as you know, with mostly Western countries. And the developing countries were under colonization in the 40s. I think there was Pakistan there and a few others. And Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, was the leader there. But that agenda is being questioned, and it's being said that this is a Western agenda. It didn't come from us as developing countries. What needs to be done is to take that rights, the, the elements of, or the principles of human rights and see how we can contextualize them into the context of the people so they feel it is my right. When a woman does not die when she is giving birth, then her right to health is clear, and so on and so on. So we need to, to take those principles of human rights and see how we can fit them into the societies. Otherwise, the, 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 com the questioning that is continuing that human rights are a Western paradigm that doesn't apply to us will continue. And we need to use them to question the practices that are ongoing and also to make them part of the context and the language, the symbols and so on. And you talked about symbology. 
of the people themselves. So we need a transformational movement in terms of making human rights owned by the people and not just words that are said in the UN summit that is taking place. I will stop here and we can go on.